Well, a very good morning to everyone and welcome to our first ever Pretty Gate Baptist Church online church service streamed via Zoom and later on YouTube as well. Uh, can I give you a very warm welcome if you're watching online or if you're connecting via telephone um, or also if you're watching it or listening to it recorded on our website then welcome to you as well. Um, it's absolutely brilliant to be able to um, use this new technology to carry on meeting as a church fellowship during this uh, rather odd time where we're all uh, stuck in our own homes most of the time but it's uh, fantastic to see so many of you here this morning. We're going to be having a bit of a shorter service than we'd normally have on a Sunday this morning so we're going to be focusing on giving you a, a bit of a, a news update and then prayer, a Bible reading and um, a sermon which Peter's going to be bringing to us from Psalm 27. Um, and uh, then hopefully kind of in the weeks ahead we're going to be able to add more to the services to have uh, other opportunities for um, possibly some, some worship music involved and um, chances for other people to, uh, to take part and that sort of thing. Um, so, as it's our first online service, I'm going to be talking you through some of the technical side of things a little bit to begin with and then sharing a few thoughts about coronavirus and this situation and how we might respond to it as a church fellowship. And then we're going to have a time of prayer and then hear from God's word. So, on the tech side of things, if you can see and hear me, then congratulations, you've basically done everything that you need to do this morning. Um, just to say, if you're using Zoom for the first time, there's a couple of ways that you can view it. And for the purposes of this morning, the easiest way is to have what's called gallery view selected. So you should have either my face or Peter's face really big on your screen and everyone else quite small all along the top. If, if we have, um, if we use this software for doing church meetings like the Tuesday nights and that sort of thing, then you can use, I think it's called, um, oh, is it called speaker view? There's another view where everyone is the same size all across the screen, which is better for having a, a, a group conversation. But for now, the uh, the gallery view is, is best. And um, yeah, so the software we're using, Zoom, is mainly kind of designed for large meetings. Businesses use it loads and we've decided to use it because if we were using just something like YouTube we'd just be playing you a video and you'd just be there watching it at home and there'd be no way to take part whereas in future if we get all, all the technology working right we'll be able to get different people to do the bible reading different people to pray and you know possibly have chances to respond and give testimony and that sort of thing so if you bear with us a little bit while we're getting it developed hopefully we'll be able to have some pretty exciting services and, and new things going on in, in the coming weeks um so yeah just just so that you're aware if you're not already everybody's microphones are muted except mine and peter's so basically you can say whatever you like or even heckle or whatever no one will hear um, and also if, if you want to to hide your video you can um you know if you'd rather be a bit private but but it's uh, it's also it is nice to see people and especially for when we when we come to um, to preaching, it's really encouraging for us to be able to see people's faces and, and you're, you're responding rather than just preaching to a load of little um, black squares with, with people's names on it. Um, yeah, so this morning you're just going to hear um, Peter and myself speak and we're not going to have, you know, a children's talk or any of the, uh, the normal things like that, but... Uh, um, yeah, we will try and be adding those things. And um, and also we, we hope in the future to maybe have a chance at the end of the service to talk to each other, as, you know, more like a normal socialising time that we would usually have or to ask questions about the sermon or that sort of thing. But at the end of today, we're just going to have the sort of Peter will close the service as normal and then the meeting will end and you'll all just get disconnected basically. But in, in the future, that, that might not be um, how it works. Uh, and then just the final technical thing to say is um, if you haven't got a Bible at home, which you, you might not have if you're used to using the church Bibles, if you go on to BibleGateway.com, you can get absolutely all of the Bible at the click of a button and you can put all sorts of different translations in. So you can use the, the NIV, the New International Version, what we normally have in the, the church uh, Bibles. And that's what I'm going to be reading from. So that's pretty much everything I want to say on, on a technical side and um, 
And uh, from a, a kind of a, a news um, updates sort of thing, I'm, I trust that most people, if you've made it here, you've either received the letter or the email that we sent out this week talking about the church being closed and, and the decision that the, um, the eldership made kind of responding to the, the government advice. But if you haven't seen that, there's um, a news post on the website that has got most of that information detailed explaining um, you know, how, how we came to the decision and what, what the implications are. Um, but really the, the most crucial thing to just sort of point out to people is, is just how important it is to, um, to stay kind of in contact with each other as a church fellowship. So, you know, any opportunity you have to, to ring people, to, to send texts, WhatsApps, you know, um, emails is, uh, is really important because for some people that will be the only contact they're getting throughout the week so that's you know this is just such a, a although it's a, a huge challenge the kind of coronavirus thing it's a real opportunity to show our, our love and care for each other and also to reflect you know that love that god gives us first to reflect that out to to other people and be a kind of a light in our community even while we're all trapped in together and and obviously above all else it's just vital that we keep praying for each other during this time and i was kind of thinking back this morning a bit to uh, the book of Colossians that we've been studying as a church these last two or three months and, and thinking that kind of if you look at that um the first chapter again about when Paul's talking about how they, they heard the, the gospel for the first time when they kind of met as a church it would have been really really unimpressive wouldn't it because they would have had you know that they only just heard the gospel of Christ for the first time and um they wouldn't have had a, a nice church building they wouldn't have had hymn books they possibly didn't even have any songs to sing or a band to sing them they didn't have you know a powerpoint presentation they, they didn't even have a whole bible or they probably couldn't even afford a whole new test a whole old testament they would have maybe just had a, a couple of psalms and a bit of isaiah or something and then they've just got this word that a guy epaphras had, had brought to them talking about jesus and it was very very unimpressive even less impressive than the fairly minimal service we're having this morning and so um, it's kind of important to, to realise that that is enough. Even if all you've got is the testimony of Jesus Christ on its own, that is all we actually need. And in verse 7 of chapter 1 of Colossians, um, Paul writes that the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. So if this morning kind of feels a bit bare bones and unimpressive compared to, you know, lots of the, the kind of premium glossy content that you see on the internet elsewhere, then just remember that's kind of how it's meant to be when we do church. We don't need flashy and showy presentation. All we need is that truth of Christ in whom all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And we just need that message of salvation that Jesus brings. So on, on that note, I'm going to um, just sort of open in, in prayer a little bit and then I'll, I'll kind of pass over to Peter who will continue in prayer and then possibly add a few more things as well. So just let us pray. Mm -hmm. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the chance to, to meet as a church fellowship even in these um, uncertain times and over this uh, rather unfamiliar method of the internet. We pray that you'd help us to get all the, the technical side of things right and to get um, everyone connected so that they can see and hear what's going on Lord and we pray that you would be um, really revealing yourself to us and um, reminding us that um, we don't need to be physically gathered in a building to be gathered with our God because you're with us wherever we are Lord and we pray that you'd give us strength to um, to endure everything that's going on and, and just keep filling us with um, a sense of your peace and, and a real joy at knowing you, our living God, and the fact that your hand is, is directing all things, Lord. And we just pray that you'd help us to, to rest in you and, and be assured and calm and, uh, and knowing that even if we don't know what's going on, Lord, that you have got everything arranged, you've got everything sorted out, and, and uh, you know how all of this is going to uh, play out. So we, we thank you for that and just for our wonderful saviour Jesus and everything he's done for us that he's our example in all things and that we can look to him to to see how we should live out our lives in, in his name we pray amen 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 I don't know if you've got me up there uh yeah we, hang on a minute 
I'll get you back, Peter. Right, Peter. Hopefully, you should be on the uh, on most people's screens fairly big at the moment. Uh, yeah. No. Got a, got a no. Oh, yeah. That's there. We're there now. <laughs> lovely. Well, it's great to see you all. Really good to see you. And um, this is getting a bit over familiar uh, being on the computer screen uh, uh, these these days. Um, so, um, but it is lovely that so many of you've been able to join us. I can see that a number of you have been struggling with the sound. And perhaps Matthew, at the end of what, what's I've prayed with you, maybe Matthew can just give a, a, br a brief um, um, way of getting in again if some of you have joined us later. But let's just let's just pray again, it's, um, and then I'll, I'll just say a few words. Our loving Heavenly Father, we our hearts just ache as we look around the world and we see the impact of the coronavirus on communities, on countries. Father, uh, many of us will have seen the pictures in Italy and seen the um, the awful scenes there as Italy struggles to come to terms with this and as doctors and nurses and medical teams um, fight this virus and loving father we want to pray again that you would be merciful to our our world to our nation to the nations of this world father we we pray that you would uh, enable those teams that are working hard to try and find a, an antidote, trying to find a way forward to defeat this virus, Lord, that you would give them great wisdom and insight. And loving Father, we pray that you would um, just soon bring uh, a way forward. We, we just want to pray that you would guide the, the medical teams especially, for the, those who will be on the front line of dealing with those who have the coronavirus and uh, and treating them in hospital. Lord, we pray that they may be given strength and endurance and that Lord God they might be given the the patience and the grace to do this work Lord we, we want to especially pray God uh, the, those in this community God this fellowship we pray that you would keep us safe and help us to put into practice the practical steps we need to put in place to keep safe but also Lord we look to you because you are our only hope you are our protector you are our hope and loving Father, we, we pray that whether it be coronavirus, whether, whether it be any other um, difficulty or struggle in our lives, that we may look to you and bring our concerns and our needs before you. For you are the God of salvation. You're the God who can rescue us and keep us. Father, we pray especially for our children. Lord, we thank you for those who may well be listening right at this moment. and We pray that you would watch over them. Uh, Lord, probably at the moment it's quite exciting being away from school but Lord it's also a time for them of um, real anxiety and um, and can be really worrying and we pray that you be with them and help them as they continue to do their work even though they'll be working from home we pray for their teachers who are teaching in very different ways we pray that Lord for those involved in exams uh, those who are studying uh, who are hoping to take exams but it's all changed and Lord we pray they might just be able to trust you. So loving Father, we pray for one another. We thank you for each other. We thank you for that once again that we can link up through the means of the computer. And loving Father, we pray that as we come to your word in a little while, that Lord, it might speak to our hearts, that you would have a message for us that would encourage us in these difficult times. Loving Father, we just trust in you. And Lord, we pray that you would be especially close to those who are suffering with this sickness at the moment. Lord, keep them looking to you. We pray especially that our nation in the midst of this great trial would turn its eyes to you, would look up to the one who is the only hope for this world. Lord, we pray, help us to uh, open our ears, to have ears that are open to your megaphone as you speak through this sickness. And Lord, we come to you now. We pray that as we listen to your word, that you would fill us with joy as we develop this technology so we can have a more full service, perhaps with music as well, we pray that, Lord God, you guide us. And we pray for all churches around the country, around the world, who are getting used to this technology, are trying to use technology to communicate the message of your word and to support your people. And we pray for those who perhaps maybe are listening right now to this, this um, broadcast, even though they may not be part of our church, you've just come across it. We pray you'd bless them in a very special way today in jesus name amen amen well um yeah just um really to, to say that these are um kind of 
really tough times. We know that. But we've put in place um, a, a means of trying to keep in contact with you. Um, we're going to be uh, using the phone a lot, using WhatsApp, just trying to make sure that you're supported. And can I just encourage you not to hesitate? If you need support, if you need something, just put it out there. Contact me or Matthew, and we would uh, we will do everything we can to try to support you um, through this time. Um, so, uh, Matthew, do you want to just give a very brief, quick? Um, explanation of how we can link in if those there's one or two people still haven't got sound but well the the problem is if, if i haven't got sound they won't be able to hear my instructions and things so it, <laughs> it, i think it, the, it's probably the, the best thing to it is just to say that if, if you are connected now successfully and you know someone who's who's struggling today let them know that the, the whole service will be up on video at some point later on once we've got it all worked out but if you can help somebody to connect again next week if you've managed to get it worked out then um, that would be, be really appreciated yeah that's great um, I was just into, on, on a sort of a, a different bit of um, news it'd be worth um, just um, pointing out uh, we heard a bit of news from um, Sarah Clay our missionary in Peru because as many of you will probably know she's been um, kind of a bit uncertain about um, how she's going to get back to the UK because she's been uh, due to uh, to come come back and um, we've heard that uh, I think there now is the possibility of flights if she can get back to um, to Lima the, the uh, capital then um, there will be uh, yeah, flights arranged by the British Embassy, but Sarah needs to find a way to actually get herself physically from Juarez, where she lives, back to uh, to Lima. So that would be something that would be uh, really important to pray about. And also just the practical things of when she does get back to the UK, uh, of, uh, you know, somewhere for her to live and uh, and that sort of thing. So, so do uh, yeah, remember uh, Sarah Clay in, in your prayers. Great. Good. Well, Matthew, do you want to... Um um to pray and then we'll, we'll then read god's word for us mm, okay. so you want to be just you'll need to be in psalm 27 psalm 27 is where we're going to be looking uh, in a few moments yeah sure um so yeah let's pray yeah lord we just again want to, to pray again that you would be um really uh looking after all of our church fellowship and all those people who we're uh, involved with, especially those who are sort of um, no longer um, with us at the moment. So we think of people like the students, many of them traveling um, back this week to, to their homes, which aren't even um, just other places in the UK, but are uh, far flung corners of the world, including Southeast Asia, Lord. And we pray for those who have not yet got back that you'd help them to, to travel safely. And for those who have, traveled back to, to kind of a, a more extreme situation than us who are in, in lockdown. We pray, Lord, that you would um, sort of ease all of their, their paths so that um, they can get where they need to go safely and that you would continue to, to provide for them, Lord. And, and we pray, especially for people like our, our children and young people who um, are no longer going to be going to school, Lord, that um, you would keep them occupied and uh, and not feel too frustrated and bored to be at home, Lord, and that you would help them to be um, finding new ways to uh, to play and enjoy each other's company and also new ways to to learn both kind of the, the things that they ought to be learning at school, but also learning of, of you, Lord God, from your word and um, from sharing with each other. So we, we pray for our children and young people that you'd uphold them and uh, also for all of those who are disrupted in their work life, whether that means um, working from home instead of going into the office or even people who are losing work as a result of this um, coronavirus, Lord, which we know there are so many people. We pray that you'd help people to get the support that they need, the financial aid from the, the government that's been offered, that that would come quickly. We pray that people's employers would be really patient and kind and generous to their employees, Lord, and that you would... Uh, just keep providing for us our, our daily bread, Lord. Keep giving us the uh, the sustenance that we need, and the um, you know the, the finances and, and all the other things that uh, we take for granted so often, Lord. But now uh, you know might seem rather uh, kind of un uncertain, Lord. We we pray that you'd continue to to support them and um, help us just to be um, be good 
families together, Lord. We're so many of us are we're, we're busy out and about so much of the week, and we're not used to spending whole uh, days and weeks uh, all um, in in one uh, building together, Lord. So we pray that you'd help us, either individuals who are um, feeling very isolated. We pray that you'd help them, or um, you know, up to the, the kind of the, the largest family who might be feeling all a bit, a bit kind of claustrophobic and, and shut in, um, in indoors, Lord. We pray that you'd help us to be uh, loving each other, being patient and kind and bearing in, bearing with one another through all the, um, the difficulties and, and even squabbles, Lord, and, and help us to forgive one another and to be, uh, that you would be building us up in, uh, in unity and, and love for one another, Lord. And uh, we pray um, as we, uh, we read the, um, this psalm together that you'd be speaking powerfully through your word and through what Peter has to say for us, Lord. In, in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. So I'm going to uh, be reading from Psalm 27. So it's, uh, I would quote a page number, but it's just on the internet in front of me. So, uh, so yeah, it's the, the New International Version, Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked advance against me to devour me, it is my enemies and my foes who will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God, my saviour. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes, for false witnesses rise up against me, spouting malicious accusations. I remain confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So I'll just pray quickly for Peter before he brings this word to us. Lord, we pray for our pastor Peter. We thank you so much for him and for the gifts that you've given him. And we just pray that um, you would enable him to speak your word boldly and powerfully to us, Lord, that the truths of your scriptures, even this psalm that was written well over 2,000 years ago, Lord, we pray that you would show us just how relevant it is to our, our present day situation, Lord, and the fact that your truth speak to every single age and every day of uh, our reality, Lord. And we pray that you would help us to, to listen carefully and openly and that we would take these words to heart in jesus name amen 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 great okay and um, now uh, just before i start uh sam it's your last uh, sunday with us isn't it today can you <laughs> okay so it's we can't oh here we go we might be able to get sam i'm not sure All right you got sam yeah yeah Sam, so yeah, it's your final. Um, it's your final Sunday. Well, you're going to be heading down um, down south from from today. Yeah, that's right. So on Friday, I head down back to my family. Of course, uh, if we're still doing services like this, then I'll still be able to join you for sure. Right. Um, but yeah, 
Yeah. It'll be my last Sunday in Colchester. Yeah. Well, Sam, it's been great to have you with us over these past few years and uh, we'll be praying for you as uh, you head uh, away from us and I'm, I'm sure we'll stay in touch. Thank you. Yeah, you've not seen the last of me for sure. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Great. Good. Well, let's, uh, let's come to, to, to God's word then, shall we? Uh, the, the title I've given for today, as I've looked at this passage, um, it's Psalm, in Psalm 27, is where do we go when we're afraid? Where do we go when we're afraid? Now, right now, we're in the middle of this developing crisis, unlike anything that we've ever seen before in any of our lifetimes. The swift arrival of the coronavirus and the speed at which it's spread throughout the world, its impact on the economy, on our freedom, on ordinary people's lives, and now on churches throughout the world. It's filling so many people with fear and uncertainty. And part of that is because our securities are being stripped away. The things that we trusted in are being proved to be inadequate. And we're being told that the situation will get worse before it gets better. And that can be a fearful thing for so many of us, can't it? But God our Father never promised that our lives as Christian believers would be free from crisis. In his severe mercy, God allows these moments of crisis into our lives, in a sense, because we live in a fallen world. And some of those crises, they'll be small, and some of them are severe, but they're all in the hands of our loving Father God are designed for our good. And this has been the story throughout history, throughout God's people have always known times of trouble and days of distress and it's the same isn't it today in the bible god's faithful people are not those who never saw trouble but those who cried out to god in the midst of their crises the men and women who the bible lifts up as examples of godly believers are those who often face the greatest times of trouble and distress but god heard their cries he wasn't blind to their distresses and he isn't today our god listens to us he hears the voices of his people especially in times of crisis now i wonder how you're reacting to this crisis are you glued to the 24-hour news reports fearfully watching every development absorbing every comment I wonder how you're reacting to what you're seeing. It's so important, isn't it, that we listen to the Lord. I think many people, as they embrace this fear, that's why there's so much panic and self-preservation as people head round to the supermarkets and hoard food. But are we instead modelling peace and calm in the midst of that anxiety and crisis that's all around us? Psalm 27 was written to, uh, uh, to, to, was written as David experienced times of deep trouble and crisis. And that's why it's so relevant to each of us today. It shows how we can cultivate this confidence in the Lord in all of life's changing circumstances, how we can fix our eyes upon our Heavenly Father who meets us with his boundless love and amazing grace right in the midst of our pain and struggles. Now the Psalms have always been the book that Christians have turned to because part of that is because they display such a breadth of raw emotion. They say it's okay to express those emotions. They tell stories of hope and disappointment, of desperate need and abundant provision of struggle and rest. And Psalm 27 is an incredibly honest psalm about the psalmist's fears, but also it's full of hope. It's about life lived in this tension between trouble and grace. And it, it paints a picture of life in a sin-spoiled world. And there is a sense, as we listen to this psalm, where we, we can say, David knows what we're going through. He, he's been in the place where we feel ourselves now. But I hope, too, that we'll see that the focus is on Christ. The one who came to earth, the one who endured our pain, who suffered at the hands of his enemies. This psalm is about sin and redemption. Jesus is the redeemer who suffered injustice and violence. He was 
rejected, the Bible says, even by his own father, that we might know forgiveness, acceptance, life and hope in a broken world. And so Psalm 27 begins by talking about David's predicament and ours. As we read the psalm, it's clear that David is facing some pretty formidable enemies. In this case, he describes the most terrifying enemies. Verse 2, they're evil men advancing against him like wild animals, closing in for the kill, ready to devour him. In verse 3, David is at war. From his perspective, it feels like the entire army is encamped against him personally. There are evil men. Verse 2, false witnesses. Verse 12, they're saying things about David that aren't true. And verse 12, they're breathing out violence. But it's not just David's enemies, even those closest to David. His own parents, verse 10, appear to have turned against him. In the midst of all this trouble, David is tempted to think that the Lord himself has turned away from him and cast him off, forsaken him, verse 9. And sometimes that's how we feel, isn't it? When trouble comes into our lives, we wonder, where is God? What's he doing in all of this? Now, our experience, our circumstances might be quite different from what David is experiencing here. We may, we may have enemies who are seeking to bring us down, who are spitting out hurtful words and saying things about us that aren't true. It may sometimes feel like the whole world has turned against us. But often what fills us with fear is just our experience of a life that's been broken by the fall. We need to remember that the, low, the Lord has chosen um, that we, flawed people, will live our lives in a flawed and broken world. He's chosen to keep us in a place where there's injustice and jealousy and greed and conflict and trouble. And these are part of life. Perhaps sometimes we wish God had wrapped us in body armour or given us a coating of protected spiritual bubble wrap so that the problems kind of just bounce off us and leave us unaffected by the hurts and disappointments and sicknesses in the world. We need to be realistic, says David, about the world in which we live. This isn't how the world was designed to be, how it was designed to work. It's a groaning world, longing for redemption. And while we live in this world, we will experience brokenness and disease and disappointment and even death. Because this world isn't the good world that God made it to be. People will treat us badly and they'll act in self-centered and greedy ways because that's what their hearts are like. And that's why no relationship will ever be free from disappointment. No government or organization will ever be free from corruption. And there's no part of this world that was not touched by the brokenness of this world. No part of lives that aren't touched by the fall. And the coronavirus in many ways has brought this home to us, hasn't it? It's affecting everyone. People can't go to work. Children, you, you can't go to school. It's touching every part of people's lives, those who don't know the Lord and those who do. When we have comfortable, safe homes and healthy bank balances, and when we live our lives in relative comfort, it's, it's, it's easy to live independently of the Lord, almost to forget him. Perhaps a, a quick prayer in the morning when we get up, and, or maybe a prayer before we put our heads down on the pillow. When we treat each other badly, we're often surprised when they treat us badly we're often surprised that's life in a sin spoiled world and when disasters and trouble strike rather than being shocked it ought to be a reminder of just how great and how urgent our need of the lord really is so what's the lord's answer is it just to grin and bear it is it just to say well that's that's how life is i'll make the most of a bad lot well that's not the Lord's answer. The Lord gives us something and he gives us himself. To those who recognize their helplessness, he comes near. To those who walk humbly in independence upon him and his grace, he comes to us in the midst of our overwhelming fears. And so David tells us what to do with our fears. He tells us that freedom from fear comes by faith in the Lord. See that in verses 1 to three. 
Now, fear is one of those most common of human experiences, isn't it? Read about David in the Old Testament and you quickly discover that David, the giant slayer, was no stranger to fear. But what did David learn to do with his fears? Well, in Psalm 56, not the one we're looking at today, he writes, when, on, when I'm afraid, I will trust in you. When I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In other words, fear should drive us to the Lord, the rescuer. Faith in the Lord drives out fear. That's, what, why, we, that's why we need such a clear view of who the Lord is and what the Lord is like. Look at verses 1 and 3. David writes there, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army besiege me, verse 3, my heart will not fear. Can you see what David's doing here? He's magnifying the Lord in his thinking. Rather than turning, as it were, all his focus onto the problems. He's turning his attention to the Lord. He's reminding himself that the Lord is bigger than his problems and fears. And so what are we to do when we face these overwhelming fears? David says, bring them to the Lord, who is our salvation and secure stronghold. And God has always been in the business of rescuing his people. It's always been his plan to rescue a people who were dead in sins and separated from him and that's why he sent jesus to die on the cross sent him into the world to pay the price for our sins he's made us made a way for us to experience salvation to be rescued from our sins and to know god personally by trusting in jesus christ in his death and his resurrection so what are we to do with our fears like David, we need to acknowledge that the, the, the source of our fears, be, be realistic about them, but then in faith, bring them to the Lord of salvation, the God of salvation, who's able to shine a light into the darkness of our circumstances. We're to seek a deeper confidence in the one who is the stronghold of our lives. Because if the Lord is the light, my light, in the darkness of our circumstances, if I'm trusting in him for salvation, whom shall I fear? If he's my stronghold protecting me, the one I run to in the storm, the place of refuge when crises break upon me, of whom or of what need we be afraid? Even when we're overwhelmed, he is the place of safety and security for the troubled heart. We see that in verse 3. And so the question for each of us this morning is, do we have that confidence in the Lord? Do you personally have that confidence in the Lord? And what does David go on to say? Well, he goes on to say that confidence in the Lord grows as we seek the Lord. See that in verses 4 through to verse 7. I wonder where you put your security. For some people, it's in their bank balance or their pension or the home that they own. They look to those things to provide security for the future, even though as we're seeing that financial markets and pensions and money in the bank can crash and burn. For other people, their confidence is in a relationship or a network of relationships, family, friends down the pub. But of course, relationships can go wrong. In a broken world, they often do. Sometimes sickness and death takes away the very people that we love and depend upon. For some people, and this might be surprising, but it, we, we might say it's the church. Especially when you, 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 you're well fed and week by week enjoy loving Christian fellowship. But even churches can go wrong because churches are made up of broken people. Or maybe for others, it's our confidences in ourselves. You have plans for your life. It all seems to be coming together. You're fit, you're healthy, you're self-confident, and you feel you know how to succeed. But of course, it doesn't take much to flatten our self-made plans, something that we're beginning to see in these days that we live. So what was it that enabled David to be so confident in the face of such overwhelming circumstances? Was it that the Lord was to remove the problems? Was he going to take out David's enemies so they'd never bother him again? 
or one of the things you learn as you look at the Psalms, is that David's enemies are an ever-present problem. And here in Psalm 27, which was written later in David's life, he's now king. He's facing not just enemies, but he's facing all-out war. Those places that we trust can so easily be shown to be fragile. But this psalm shows us the world's greatest security system. It's not found by looking around, it's found by looking up. It's the Lord who is the stronghold of our lives. And David here expresses it in this way, in verse 4, he, he says, He longs to dwell in the house of the Lord, for it was in the house of the Lord that he, along with his fellow worshippers, find that their vision is corrected, where the focus moves away from problems to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to seek him. Here in the house of the Lord, David begins to see things as they really are. It was here that he found the security that he was longing for as he allowed himself to be taken up, not with his circumstances, but with his beautiful Lord and Saviour, where alone was to be found lasting security, strong hope for his heart and mind. And it's when we embrace and rest in the reality of who we are as God's children in Christ, children of God, chosen and loved by the one who rules everything, that we can have a strong confidence. We need to remember there's no place on earth where the Lord isn't with us. There's no situation where he isn't in control. In the coronavirus, we, we can feel weak and vulnerable, overwhelmed, afraid. But the Lord is strong and good. He rules over every sickness, over every microbe. He's perfect. He does all things well, says the Bible. He never forgets us. He never fails to deliver on his promises. And that's why we're to seek him and especially to seek his presence and his power. The next part of the psalm, we find David speaks about a rock solid shelter for his life. David has found this rock solid shelter and there are some surprises in these verses. David is confident that the Lord will pull him through because he's found a place to hide. Where do we run when life hurts? When we've been wounded and hurt by this broken sinful world? When we're exhausted, when we're frightened and overwhelmed, where do we go for protection? Where do we go for solace? Well, we often sadly go to places that are not helpful, don't we? But did you notice how many places of security David talks about here in this psalm? David sought either physically or in his heart to be at the place that he loved best. Verse 4, we've just seen this, the house of the Lord. He knew that here in the house of the Lord, as he lifted his heart and voice in worship of the Lord, he would gain a clear, a new, true perspective on his life. But as he turns his attention to the Lord, he's reminded that the Lord was his only reliable stronghold. Then in verse 5 he says, For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling or tent. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle. Now, I don't know if you've ever been camping in a violent storm. I can think of many experiences. I'm amazed our children even dream of going camping these days um, because we had so many bad experiences of camping. But I remember one occasion on a, a Welsh beach. Well, it was just behind the sand dunes, but it might as well have been on the beach. And I, in the middle of the night, I remember hanging from the bar of the tent, hoping it wasn't going to fly away, actually feeling the, the rain coming straight through the canvas. It was terrifying. And I'm thinking to myself, why does David say that, talk about a tent being a great place of protection? How does he think he can possibly be kept safe in a tent? Verses 5 and 6. Now, the tabernacle that he refers to in a minute, in a, in a few, uh, just a verse later, was the tent of God's presence that travelled with Israel as they made their way through the wilderness. And it was a visual reminder that God was among his people. But the tent that David is referring to, may it seems to be the makeshift shelters that were made out of branches erected and, and lived in during the seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, if he's thinking of these, then it's a reminder, as Leviticus 23 says, that the Lord made them dwell in booths when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And as they dwelt in those booths, 
they were recalling God's rescue, how he rescued the people from Egypt. For David, you see, these tents were a reminder that God still rescues his people. But the tent here that David has in mind, it could equally be just the cover that he pulled over himself to shade himself from the sun when he was um, a shepherd boy. I think the point that David is making is this, that no matter where he found himself, be it in the mighty temple or in a makeshift tent, the covering wasn't the thing that mattered, canvas or cast iron. It was the Lord who was there with him. It was the Lord who was keeping him safe and secure. It was the fact that the Lord was with him. It wasn't so much where he was, but who was with him. It wasn't the circumstances of his, life, of his life, but it was the intimate presence of the Lord that enabled him to raise his voice in song as he shouted out, verse 6, God's victory. And verse 5 talks about another uh, place of protection. It says, and he set me high upon a rock. Now, a number of, on a number of occasions, I found myself in deep water. And I do, on this occasion, mean the physical kind, though I've had my fair share of the other kind. Now, I'm not a strong swimmer. And I remember being terrified in the water on a number of occasions, being out of my depth, being pulled by the tide and the swirling water. And I can remember the enormous relief when I found a rock under my feet. I clung to that rock as if my life depended upon it. Now David has found a solid rock that was higher and stronger than his fears and his confidence is no longer in himself or in his ability. He's come to depend upon someone else. But I wonder if you notice that he doesn't say, I found a rock and I grabbed hold of it and climbed onto it. Now David writes in that verse, in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and he set me high upon a rock. He set me high upon a rock. What is this rock or rather who is this rock that we come to for help? Well, our troubles are meant to lead us to this rock who is Christ. The only place where we can find lasting peace and rest and security. And that's why he's the one that we're to seek in these difficult times. He's the one who reaches out to us in our sin and rebellion. He's the one who reaches out to us in our troubles and fears and lifts us out of the deep water, or as the hymn says, out of the sinking sand, he lifted me. It's he who sets our feet on solid ground. And that's why in times of trouble like David, we're to seek the Lord's face even when we're stressed by circumstances. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm stressed, I, I, I just start to panic and I look around at all the problems. But David says, when you find yourself stressed, when you find yourself overwhelmed, that's the time to seek the Lord's face. Initially, when we read those verses in 7 through to verse uh, 12, we, they appear to be expressing the same seeking of the Lord that we saw in verse 4. But there's something different here. Let me just read these verses to you again. Hear my voice when I call, O Lord. Be merciful and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. Oh God, my saviour, though my f father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. Teach me your way, O oh Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. Do not turn me over to the desire of my foes. For false witnesses rise up, breathing out violence. Can you see what's going on here? The delight of those earlier verses have given way to alarm. David is frightened and overwhelmed and his confidence in the Lord is being shaken. I wonder if you can relate to David's experience. Sometimes we, we, we lay our fears and difficulties before the Lord and the problems just go away. Other times it's not that the problem goes away or the difficulty remains, but we find a new courage and strength to face the difficulty. But sometimes 
nothing changes. The situation stays as it was, and the courage that we long for just doesn't materialize. And at times like this, David says, we need to take ourselves in hand and remind ourselves in the midst of our trouble and our difficulty, not to run away from God, but to run towards him. I, I guess he's saying, really, have a conversation with yourself about the Lord. Tell ourselves that God is near. Speak to ourselves the great truths about the Lord that we read in Scripture. Tell ourselves those promises that he has given us. Renew our confidence in those truths. That we're helpless sinners deserving nothing from him. But the Lord alone is our all-sufficient saviour. This is what David is doing in verses 9 and 10. And it's what we must do. And then verses 11 and 12. What's David doing here? He's recommitting himself not to seek his own independent way to escape difficulty, but to follow the Lord's way, whatever that might mean. He commits himself to a relentless pursuit of the Lord, to seek his guidance and his power and his protection in the face of his own helplessness. See, Psalm 27, along with the rest of the Bible, is clear. We are people in desperate need. If we haven't realised that, we are making a grave mistake. Sometimes we forget that, even especially when life's going well. In times like a crisis of coronavirus, it brings it home to us, doesn't it? See, does my life, does your life send out the message that I am in desperate need? Does my commitment to my fellow believers and my relationship with them send out that message? Does my personal devotional life portray me as a, as a person who humbly acknowledges that I need help. If you and I have been, by God's grace, forgiven and welcomed into his family, into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, with God himself, that's what it should look like in our lives. We know that he is the one who alone can give us all the help that we need. We know that he is the only sufficient one. So when in difficulty, do you run to Jesus? Do you run to Jesus? Well, this psalm ends with confidence and courage for a hard-pressed people. We're not told whether the problem got taken away for David or not. But what David ends this <coughs> psalm with is a great confidence and a, an expression of courage. As he says this, I'm still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. So when God asks you to wait, what happens to your spiritual muscles? Do they grow stronger or weaker? When God asks you to wait, it's not because he's forgotten you or he's not keeping his promise. It's that God is giving you time to consider his glory and to grow stronger in your faith. As God asks us to wait for the answer, will we trust his faithful promises? There's the first choice. Will we trust his faithful promises or will we question those promises, his love and his goodness? For many of us, trusting the Lord through this coronavirus, especially if it lasts a long, long time, is going to be hard. Trusting God will sometimes be hard. But we mustn't give in to discouragement and fear. Our God is wise and he's loving and kind. And his timing is perfect. And he, he will use every tool at his disposal to rescue each of us from ourselves and to make us into the likeness of his son, Jesus. And whether that's through waiting, or whether that's through the impact of the coronavirus on our lives, or whether that's through him providing a solution, we wait upon him. But let's remember what I said earlier. We don't have to wait to heaven before we can expect and experience the Lord's goodness in our lives. We can experience it now. David is confident that the Lord will deliver him in, his, in this life. He's confident that even in the midst of trouble, the Lord will work out his good purposes in his life. And it's what the New Testament says, isn't it? In Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 8, his great chapter on present suffering and future glory, 
he says this, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. And so do we believe that? That God is going to use whatever happens for our good and for the blessing of the world. We trust that he will. When you're afraid, where do you run? Let me urge you to run to the Lord, to seek him, to seek his presence, seek his face. This coronavirus has given us perhaps more time to pray, more time to read our Bibles, more time to reconnect with the Lord. Let's pray that we might do that. Let's encourage one another as a fellowship to seek him, to seek his face and to rest in his amazing salvation. Let's pray, shall we? Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are faithful. We thank you that you are good. Father, we pray that as a, a fellowship, as we experience the, uh, the, the things that are happening in our world at the moment, Lord, we pray that we would be those that trust you, that wait upon you, that seek you with all our heart. Father, we know that many of the securities that people look to, their finance, their homes, their, their jobs, their, their friendships, their relationships, so many of these things are being stripped away. The, the things that people rely on, the visits down to the pub, the meeting up with their mates, these things are being taken away. Lord, we pray that in these difficult times, that not just your people, but many people would cry out to you for mercy. They would come to you, the God who saves, the God who is the rescuing God. And that, Lord God, that we would walk with confidence, that we would know where to go with our fears. When our hearts tremble within us, help us to bring those fears to you, to lay them before you, for you care for us. Lord, help us, we pray. Help us to be a, a light <coughs> shining in the darkness. Lord, help us to care for the people around us. May you, the, the people in this community, the people around us, see that Christians are not just bowing to the same fears that they are, but that we are reaching out with compassion, finding ways to love uh, the people around us, showing expressions of your kindness, expressions of your love. Lord, we pray that in these days, this, that your church would rise up with a new confidence in you, a new love for you, and a new desire to serve others. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, um, we're going to um, draw our, our service to a close. Um, it's been lovely to see you. I can see some of you, some of you are hiding away, and, uh, but it's been uh, really good and it's a, a great encouragement. I should say this, it's a huge encouragement for me to be able to see some of your faces um, and uh, you know, that, that's a real, real blessing. So uh, it's been great to see you and uh, uh, we, we, um, we'll have more in place for next week. Hopefully by next week we'll have a, um, a children's slot. Uh, we hope to have some music in place as well. Um, Maybe later this week, we're also hoping to, um, uh, to have a, a ladies' Bible study conducted through this same means and uh, uh, possibly a preaching course as well. So that's something we're doing. Hi there, <laughs> more of you are appearing. So uh, we would really um, love to sort of connect with some of you through that. And so do please um, keep watching the website, um, looking out for emails and news about what we're up to. Um, but we want to be innovative. We want to be really creative. So don't be afraid to share your news as well. Um, maybe for some of you, it might be that your jobs have been uh, are really in difficulty. Do share that so we can be praying as a church. Um, we want to be uh, you know, really supporting each other, finding ways that we can come alongside uh, each other in our need. Um, and so, yeah, if you've got ideas, um, send them our way. Uh, Mr. Technical himself, Matthew, will work hard to try and find ways to bring these things to, uh, into being. But we, we really thank you. Um, for, for It's lovely to see so many of you online. I think we've had between 47 and 50 of you uh, uh, or linked up. So that's absolutely fantastic. 
and uh, a special welcome if there's any of you out there who are not part of Pretty Gay but you've just kind of linked into us. Ah, oh, great to see you, Phoebe. <laughs> really good to see you there. And Josh as well, uh, really good to see you. Um, but um, keep praying. But as we come to the end of our time together, I'm just going to read an amazing verse from Romans chapter 8 uh, as we come to an end. So um, here we go, Romans chapter 8. Oh, and just to say before I read it, there is chance to share anything, any response to this service on our chat as well. So we look forward to you feeding those through. Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God for such an amazing promise. Let's keep clinging to those promises and uh, yeah, love to know what you've, how you've felt about the service. One more, just pray again before we close. Father, thank you for the technology that's allowed us to link up as a church. We pray, Father, that it might have been a blessing as we've listened to your word. Father, help us to find creative ways to encourage and to support each other and to love one another. We thank you for your family. We thank you for the church. We thank you for our saviour. We thank you for your great salvation. And just protect us through this week. Keep us clinging to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.